This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The punch biopsy is a diagnostic tool that allows for histologic examination of skin conditions. We will first provide an overview of this procedure, followed by the indications and contraindications for the performance of a punch biopsy. We will then provide a step-by-step -step explanation and demonstration of a safe technique. Since a punch biopsy involves obtaining a sample of the full thickness of the skin, epidermal and dermal evaluation is possible. It is easy to learn how to perform a punch biopsy and the procedure has a low risk of causing clinically important scarring, bleeding, or infection. Punch biopsies aid in the diagnosis of pigmented lesions and in the diagnosis of suspected skin cancers, generalized skin eruptions, blistering disease, and vasculitides. While paniculitides may be assessed with the punch biopsy technique, a wedge biopsy is preferred at some centers to ensure adequate sampling of the fat in such lesions. A punch biopsy sample of a pigmented lesion should include 1 to 2 millimeters of surrounding normal skin when feasible. For inflammatory eruptions, the punch biopsy sample should measure at least 3 millimeters in diameter to minimize sampling error and to provide sufficient tissue for any special staining that may be required. There are few absolute contraindications to a punch biopsy. Neither anticoagulation nor even severe thrombocytopenia is a contraindication. However, to anticipate bleeding complications, it is important to determine whether the patient has a bleeding disorder or is taking any medications known to interfere with hemostasis, such as warfarin or aspirin. Ask whether the patient has known allergies to local anesthetics, antiseptics, or topical antibiotics, and any reactions to tape. Although true allergic reactions to lidocaine are rare, if a patient reports a history of a reaction to lidocaine, then a non-amide anesthetic, that is an ester anesthetic, such as tetracaine, may be used instead. More often, patients will report adverse reactions to epinephrine, which is routinely added to lidocaine to hasten the onset of anesthesia and to decrease bleeding during a procedure. A plain lidocaine solution without epinephrine may be used in such patients and in patients who are pregnant. Unless a specific lesion must be sampled, the biopsy site should be selected to obtain the maximal diagnostic yield to minimize adverse aesthetic consequences. There are several other issues to consider when selecting a biopsy site. Fresh lesions without excoriation or secondary infection will provide the best diagnostic information. A specimen taken from dependent areas such as the lower legs may have venous stasis, which may confound the histologic picture. In addition, the legs often have poorer wound healing and are susceptible to infection. If you have a choice, avoid doing a punch biopsy on the lower extremities. Biopsies performed on the back can have poor aesthetic results because the scars may stretch. Avoid doing punch biopsies on the face whenever possible. If obtaining a specimen from the face is unavoidable, remember that scars behind the ears, under the jaw, and at the hairline are the least visible. Plunging a biopsy punch into the temple, a finger, or the jaw may result in substantial injury to a nerve or artery. It is also possible to lose a biopsy site once it heals, as the lesion may no longer be visible, which may be problematic if further treatment is indicated. Taking a photograph of the marked biopsy site with the patient's consent is recommended. Set up a standing tray with a clean disposable cover and place all necessary materials on the tray. While exercising clean technique is important, it is not necessary to maintain a sterile field. You will need alcohol pads, a local anesthetic, gloves, tooth forceps, scissors, suture material, gauze, a needle driver, the punch instrument itself, and a specimen bottle that contains formalin. Although not shown here to protect the privacy of the patient, the specimen bottle label should include the patient's name, identification number, biopsy site, and the date. For a 2 or 3 millimeter punch biopsy, it is acceptable to use a hemostatic agent such as Moncel's or ferric subsulfate solution alone without suturing the defect. 
Although Moncel's solution is an excellent hemostatic agent, it may tattoo the skin. Thus, some practitioners prefer aluminum chloride to achieve hemostasis. For small punch biopsies, the aesthetic outcome can be satisfactory to excellent when the wound is left to heal by secondary intention, that is, healing without suturing. This option also has the added benefit of not requiring the patient to return for suture removal. For larger biopsies, the wound should be closed with a non-absorbable suture such as nylon or polypropylene. In general, for thick skin such as the skin on the back or volar skin, a 3-0 reverse cutting suture is advised, a 5-0 suture is recommended for the face, and a 4-0 suture for the rest of the body. The vast majority of skin biopsies are transported in formalin for routine hematoxylin and eosin stain. If a tissue culture is needed, sterile technique should be used. The specimen must be placed on a 2 by 2 inch piece of sterile gauze pre-moistened with 10 cc of saline that is not bacteriostatic inside a sterile cup such as a urine sample container. For immunofluorescence studies, Michel's solution containing ammonium sulfate is used as transport medium. Glutaraldehyde is used as transport medium for electron microscopy studies. When performing any medical procedure, it is important to educate the patient regarding its indications, risks, and benefits. After answering any questions or concerns the patient has, formal written consent must be obtained. Following appropriate timeout protocol, verify the biopsy site and side with the patient. To optimize the performance of a punch biopsy, have the patient recline on the examination table. This will allow good visibility of the site and easy access to it. Begin the procedure by cleaning the area with an alcohol swab. If the lesion is poorly demarcated, it can be outlined with a skin marking pen before the procedure. Anesthetize the area by inserting the needle parallel to the lesion and slowly raising an intradermal bleb under it. If necessary, while the needle is still in the skin, partially withdraw it and reset the angle of the tip to anesthetize the area more widely and deeply. The effects of lidocaine are almost instantaneous. In highly vascular areas such as the scalp, lidocaine with epinephrine should be used. In addition, it is prudent to wait several minutes to allow epinephrine to exert its full vasoconstrictive effects, minimizing intraoperative bleeding. To allow for the most complete sampling of pigmented lesions, it is useful to make an imprint around the lesion with the back of the punch before performing the biopsy. This imprint serves as a guide for centering the lesion in the punch. This initial imprint need not center on the lesion perfectly. The procedure is broken down into the following steps. Stretch the skin perpendicular to the skin tension lines. This results in an elliptical wound after the punch, which minimizes puckering once sutured. Hold the punch in your hand and place the fifth finger of that hand adjacent to the lesion for stability. Position the punch over the lesion. For pigmented lesions, use your imprint as a guide. Apply rotational and delicate downward pressure on the punch until you feel the give as it enters the fat layer. Withdraw the punch. At this point, bleeding may occur and require blotting with gauze. With tooth forceps, carefully grasp and lift the specimen, taking special care not to crush it. Use scissors to cut out the base of the specimen at the level of the fat. Place the specimen in a labeled bottle that contains the appropriate reagent, here, formalin. Check the punch instrument to be sure no tissue remains there. A good rule of thumb is to be able to see through the entire hollow tube. When you have finished the biopsy and have obtained the specimen, you may suture the wound. Place the sutures perpendicular to the long axis of the punch defect and or perpendicular to the skin tension lines. Begin by placing the needle through the edge of the wound. Release the needle and keeping your palm down, grasp the point with the needle driver. The wrist curves naturally, which directs the blunt end of the needle to your forceps. Reload the needle driver. Next, pierce the opposite edge of the wound with the suture. When it emerges from the skin, grab the point with your palm down handling the blunt end of the needle to your index finger and thumb. Circle the suture around the needle driver twice, then rest the driver on your thumbnail to prevent the suture from slipping. 
pull up on the thread until the free end of the suture is short and secure it with the needle driver. Next, spool the suture. Secure the first part of the knot, blotting any bleeding when necessary. Circle the suture in the opposite direction once and cinch a square knot. Repeat these steps for a total of three times and then cut the suture at about one centimeter. If a second suture needs to be placed, you can pierce the entire wound without going through the center. Place one, two, or three simple interrupted stitches depending on the size and location of the defect. For an area measuring less than three millimeters in diameter, a single stitch is sufficient. For an area measuring four to five millimeters, place two simple interrupted stitches. Place one more stitch for every one millimeter increase in size thereafter. Although complications from a punch biopsy are rare, it is important to monitor the patient for bleeding, infection, and scarring. The simple suture may fail in a few situations. For larger punch wounds and lax skin, the wound edges may invert with a simple suture. A vertical mattress suture is more appropriate in this case to evert the wound edges. On volar skin, the suture material may cut through the tissue, so bites further away from the punch defect are needed. Also, a 3.0 nylon suture will be less likely to cut through the tissue than smaller caliber sutures. On the scalp, bleeding may be brisk. The assistant can occlude the punch defect with a cotton tip applicator so the surgeon can visualize suture placement. Alternatively, place the corner of a gauze at the punch defect. The gauze will absorb the blood flow by capillary action, allowing for visualization for suture placement. In patients with thrombocytopenia or those taking an anticoagulant, it is typical to place a pressure dressing over the sutured site to prevent late onset bleeding. It can be left on for 24 hours. Remember the anatomy when performing a punch biopsy so that you avoid damage to major blood vessels and nerves. For example, avoid punching medial and lateral digits and palpate for the temporal artery before biopsying near the temple. When performing a punch biopsy on the palm, for instance, recall that there is very little subcutaneous fat and that once the entire dermis is breached, the instrument is essentially at the level of the fascia. Consequently, do not press hard on the punch. When taking a specimen from the highly vascular scalp, be prepared for brisk bleeding, as shown earlier. The bleeding can be easily controlled with the application of pressure and the placement of the first suture. When performing a biopsy on the lip, which is highly vascular and extremely pliable, use a calasian clamp to allow for easy handling and intraoperative hemostasis. In infants, the subcutaneous fat will push the specimen up, making it relatively easy to grab. Therefore, you will not need to punch much beyond the dermis. The application of a topical antibacterial agent after a punch biopsy is discouraged because allergic reactions are common. The biopsy site should be cleaned with soap and water twice a day. After cleaning, petroleum jelly should be applied to aid healing. Sutures should be removed, if necessary, one to two weeks after the procedure, depending on their location. Sutures placed on the face should be removed within one week and sutures on other parts of the body should be removed within 10 to 14 days after the procedure to minimize the risk of track marks and scarring. Punch biopsy is the major method used for the diagnosis of many dermatologic conditions. Provided you select the site judiciously, are confident that you can achieve hemostasis, and have a pathologist to assess and diagnose histopathological features of the skin, the punch biopsy technique is a helpful procedure for physicians across a broad spectrum of specialties.